Austin Givens from Utica College, an author, a counterterrorism expert, and a cybersecurity expert as well. Welcome to the show, Austin. How are you? Good morning. Good to be here with you guys. Good. Uh, you are at UC now, but I think I read your bio that you had gone abroad to study recently and are back from London. Is that right? That's correct. I'm mm -hmm. in the last month or so of a PhD program at King's College. In London. And where are you from originally? I grew up in Virginia, mm -hmm. but I was born in Rochester. You'd never know it to hear me. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Uh, your interest in counterterrorism and cybersecurity, where did, how did that arise? I was definitely a product of the 9-11 generation. I was coming through college, uh, and the 9-11 attacks happened. And so during college, I had the opportunity to intern for a few summers at the Pentagon, and that really got me going. Uh, after I graduated from undergraduate, I began consulting for the Department of Homeland Security, and my career just sort of evolved from there. And so now I found myself uh, at Utica College, and I'm very happy. We're doing a lot of exciting things. Yeah. I, think, I think it's interesting to find that there is – a need for someone in this, in this realm, in this expertise. And do, do you believe that 9-11 perpetuated that? Absolutely. There's a whole generation of professionals working in this field now who came of age and were interested in the field specifically by virtue of the fact that that attack happened. Mm -hmm. In other words, they wouldn't be working in this field were it not for that traumatic event occurring in their lives. So absolutely, I think the need remains there as the tragic attacks in Paris, I think, illustrate really well. Uh, but absolutely, there's a need and there's a growing presence of these types of folks in industry as well as in government. It's going to happen here in the United States. What do we do to prevent it? What do you think? This is a complex question mm -hmm. uh, because since 9-11, as you well know, we've taken pains to build up our intelligence capabilities. We've launched major military campaigns abroad. We are much more diligent about just being aware of our surroundings and keeping an eye on things that may look suspicious and actually doing something about it. So the irony, I think, here is that despite the Paris attacks being as tragic and dramatic as they were, we're not going to see a lot of change here. Now, there's going to be some superficial changes, the types of things you normally see, like increased police presence around sensitive monuments or events and that kind of thing. But one of the dirty little secrets of working in the intelligence and law enforcement business is that a lot of your work actually involves changing people's perceptions, not necessarily making major changes that have a big impact. So if police are more visible or if military personnel are more visible, that's something the public expects, and it makes us feel more relaxed and safer psychologically. We say that here often, that perception is reality. Very much so, very much so. Um, so I would expect to see this kind of window dressing changes in the United States, at least in the short term, say for the next week or two. But I can almost guarantee you, if you were go to go to the French consulate say, in New York City today, mm -hmm. there are going to be New York Police Department officers stationed outside with big guns. But if you were to go back two weeks from now, they're going to be gone. Mm -hmm. Your book is titled The Business of Counterterrorism. Uh, are you referring to the word business uh, as we all think of it as a business, or is it sort of a, uh, a relative term and a, uh, a colloquialism, if you will? It's very much a literal use of the word. Mm -hmm. um, since 9-11, there's been this huge increase in the role of profit-seeking businesses in the counterterrorism industry. Uh, and so the book, at its heart, really walks through where businesses are involved in counterterrorism by looking at specific areas of homeland security like critical infrastructure protection which deals with you know things like banks and hospitals uh, other areas like disaster recovery how we clean up after a hurricane or earthquake and so it's a really fascinating look i think at how this industry as a whole has changed from being something that's very top heavy with government agencies into something that's much more mixed between business owners and government agencies kind of working hand in hand together. Well, that, that's a scary perspective, I think, if you, if you really look at it. How about the differences for you uh, since 9-11 in progressing, trying to track the differences in terrorism, you know, going from different breeding grounds. You know, Afghanistan obviously was the focus during 9-11. Now we see it spanning all over Europe really as well. Uh, you know, how has that changed for you as far as, uh, you know, tracking? It's been a very interesting evolution, as you said, because, of course, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, we were focused on Afghanistan. 
Uh, then we went into Iraq where things were actually relatively stable before we went in. Right. And then after we took the lid off the pot, so to speak, uh, there was a lot of fomentation and growth in certain extremist groups. Now, of course, with instability in Syria, we're seeing the growth of a group like ISIS there as well as in Iraq. Um, so the environment in which terrorism grows seems to be shifting around globally. And the same is true here at home, by the way. I mean, we have domestic terrorists inside the United States, mm-hmm. whether extremist white supremacist type groups mm-hmm. um, or those who are radicalized online by looking at ISIS propaganda and getting involved in that sort of thing. Talking to UC Professor Austin Givens, the author of The Business of Counterterrorism, here on the Talk of the Town at 100.7 FM WUTQ. Donald Trump wants to put up a big wall to span the border between the United States and Mexico. Alabama has closed its borders today. Michigan has closed its borders. Our poll question is all about whether we should continue to welcome immigrants and refugees into this country on a limited basis or at all. What are your thoughts on closing the borders in general and specifically with regard to this situation as a, a counter-terrorist measure? I don't feel that closing the border would do much for us. Uh, I think, if anything, it would be yet another example of window dressing, a superficial move that isn't going to have a major practical effect. We have to remember that when we close the border, we're not just shutting it off to potential terrorists. We're also shutting it off to tractor trailers that are carrying goods and produce for sale in the United Mm -hmm. States. People buy and sell those here for their jobs. And so we're also denying economic growth and activity from American business owners when we do that sort of thing. So there's not a free lunch here. You can't close the border and expect there to be no negative consequences. So I think we have to think very carefully about that type of decision because on balance, I don't think it's going to be all that effective. And in fact, I think the damage that closing the border could cause to the U.S. economy is far worse than what we might expect to see from one extremist or or two extremists coming over the border. And I think you make an interesting point, and that's some of the things that we we talked about this morning, many different aspects that, you know, we, we look at this as face value, the attacks and what happened in Paris, but the consequences of commerce and finance and safety, and all the these things that and that might perpetuate that you made a good point that uh, going back to your original your your original idea of we, the window dressing. So we may not see this happen today or tomorrow, but it may affect us a few months down the road when that gentleman couldn't get his tractor and trailer in, when his shipment wasn't able to reach the U.S. border, and that is when we're going to be affected. I think those are very interesting points. And maybe sticking with that, um, the idea of how do we combat that right here on our own soil? You mentioned uh, some of these these radicals getting involved over the Internet. Do you, do you believe that's the main way at this point? Yeah, certainly Internet propaganda is one of the top issues that federal agencies are facing right now. How to counter the terrorist message because they're able to produce very slick videos, use social media extremely effectively, all with a view to pulling people into their cause. And what's interesting, I think, is that for young people, the types of young people who are now making their way to Syria and Iraq to join ISIS. Which we see in this attack here, all young all young gentlemen. Exactly. Those same young people are being motivated by the same kind of inherent human values that all young people have. The desire to be part of something bigger than themselves. The desire to help a cause that is larger than themselves, the desire to simply be part of something big. Those are the key underlying motivators that we see in folks going to Iraq and Syria. So inside the United States, if we're able to tap into that same kind of sentiment and motivate people to do something else that's positive, like volunteering in a community, picking up garbage, serving the elderly, those are also outlets for that same energy. And I think one of the big challenges we're going to face is how to channel that same youthful energy into positive community building activities that ultimately have a great long term effect on American society. Fascinating. How much of the counter terrorist activity that you would suggest that we undergo in this country is cyber security in nature versus, I don't know what you call brick and mortar or real type of uh, um, counter terrorism measures that aren't. Um, related to the internet what's what's the percentage that you're finding there it's an excellent question the truth is there's such a blending now of the cyber and the real world that you almost can't treat them as separate topics they're interrelated they're twisted together 
So if I were to actually put a percentage on it, I'd say it's between 80 and 90 percent uh, because so much messaging occurs through the Internet. 80 percent cyber security measures. Ab- absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. Um, we talk about messaging, including encrypted messaging mm-hmm. that extremists use to communicate with one another. That's squarely in the cyber domain. So all of this that's going on maybe is beyond our control. When you talk about closing the borders, things that we can do, maybe it's up to the experts in cybersecurity to sort this out is kind of what I'm getting from what you're saying. Here. And I think with that, Dave, maybe to answer that, we're, we're blinded, I think, by this because you mentioned the in, you know how they intermingle. And we do that more and more as just normal human beings and citizens every day in our life with banking and messaging and getting our information. So we might have a blind eye to that, saying, ah, it's just a, you know, a day-to-day activity. Mm-hmm. I would encourage people when they think about this issue that instead of looking at the online presence of an extremist uh, and the real-world ex- presence of a terrorist or extremist as separate topics, they really are one and the same. As you mentioned, just like our ordinary lives today, mm-hmm. I'm sitting here, I have an active Twitter account that I use for professional reasons, I have a LinkedIn account, and those are extensions of me. Right. And I think that's true for most folks who use social media as well. And extremist terrorists, they're no different in that regard. They're using this as extensions of themselves. So to the extent that we can tackle the online piece better, we'll be that much further ahead of the battle. Talking to Austin Givens, the UC professor and the author of a counterterrorism book, The Business of Counterterrorism. You said you had consulted with the U.S. government when you were uh, a, uh, I don't know, an intern, was it, in Washington, D.C.? I started out as an intern at the Pentagon, mm-hmm. and uh, from there I went to work on Capitol Hill for a while mm-hmm. and then began consulting for the Department of Homeland Security. So that's sort of how my career launched, if you will. Well, it's an interesting line that you, you, you started off as an intern. I always say this to kids wanting to get into broadcasting. You know, They say, well, what do I do? I say, well, intern somewhere, get your foot in the door, and then if you're any good at it with a passion for what you do, you'll probably get promoted. Is that, was that your experience there? And what led to your promotion from intern to consultant for the U.S. government? It's an excellent question, and I completely agree with you. Internships are invaluable in almost any industry in terms of giving you real-world experience and exposure to how things actually work as opposed to how you've learned that they work in books Mm -hmm. or in class. So in my particular case, having an internship got me a security clearance, which permits me to view classified information. And having that security clearance is sort of the golden ticket to jobs in the counterterrorism industry because without it, you can't see secret stuff. Mm -hmm. You can't see secret stuff, you can't do much. Um, So having that clearance in hand and also the connections that I gained through that position uh, were invaluable. They gave me knowledge of different areas of the U.S. government. Uh, I developed good relationships with folks from inside the Pentagon, inside the CIA, inside the NSA. And so having those kind of personal relationships are so key in basically every industry today, in the defense and security industries. Was there a singular moment where you made an observation or something like that and somebody said, wow, you might be onto something there. Hey, wait a minute. Come tell this to this other guy down the hall. Was there, some, was there a moment like that that occurred that, uh, in, 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 in this whole uh, timeline for you? That's a nice question. Um, it, I'm smiling. Listeners can't see that. But um, <laughs> uh, there was a point where we had the Brazilian Minister of Defense coming to visit us. The Minister of Defense is like the Secretary of Defense for Brazil, so a pretty important guy. Mm -hmm. and my boss was developing a briefing for this guy. And he suggested to me that when I was putting together this briefing that I include some specific information. I can't say specifically what that was, but Mm -hmm. let's just leave it at that. And when I heard this recommendation, my eyes got big as plates, and I said to myself, oh, my gosh, I'm not sure I should really be saying that because it might ruffle a lot of feathers. Hmm. So I went to a colleague, and I said, you know, let me just run this by you real quick get your thoughts. And so I shared this information with my colleague and she said, absolutely not leave it out. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I did the final briefing, you know, those facts were excluded and it potentially avoided some political ramifications say between the U S and Brazil. so I remember that clearly as a defining moment in my internship. And it, it sort of made me think, you know, I can do this. Mm-hmm. I can do this. And having that little shot of confidence is a, a great help when you just starting out. Mm-hmm. How's the book doing, the counterterrorism? Yeah, what, what pushed you to write that? Yeah. As well? Um, well, I wrote it with a friend of mine who's a political scientist in Virginia. Um, and we had actually put on a conference a year beforehand, so in 2010, before we began writing the book. 
that brought together folks from industry and government who are working in this space. And we started talking about it after the fact, and we decided, gosh, you know, it'd be really cool to write a book about this topic and just explore it in depth. So that's really what sparked it. And so over the next three years, from 2011 to 2014, we wrote it. It came out last year. It's been doing modestly well. Um, but you have to keep in mind that academic books don't sell like sure. John Grisham novels. <laughs> right. um, the impact, though, in terms of educating folks about the fact that this phenomenon exists and bringing positive exposure to my institution, Utica College, has been invaluable. Um, and so I'm very grateful. And as an expert in cybersecurity here at Utica College and what with the plans that are going on with regard to the uh, influx of folks with the nanotechnology, you're going to be around here for a while doing this kind of thing, do you imagine? I will be around as long as they will have me. <laughs> uh, and it is my goal to be removed from my office feet first. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't mind me asking, how, how old of a guy are you? Uh, I'm 33. 33, okay. So we're, we're around the same age. I, I, one of the other questions we talked about, the finance and, and economic end of it, um, but in some of my notes, uh, having a young child, how do you explain this to children? Do you have a thought on that? That's a great question because uh, I do have a young child myself. I'm a dad. My daughter is one about to turn two in December. Um, and, and it's strange, you know, because I'm sure my wife and daughter are listening to this right now live. and you know, They'll see me on TV talking about this stuff. And in general, at least with small children, you try to insulate them. You mm -hmm. try to give them a proper childhood as best you can. Mm -hmm. um, but there will come a day when, you know, she learns that daddy deals in blood and guts mm -hmm. and bad guys. Mm -hmm. um, but that's my job. And so when I go home, I do my best to shut that off. I don't watch shows like Homeland. I have sports and comedy. That's, that's <laughs> my outlet. Was that's, Homeland pretty accurate in terms of uh, some, some of the authenticity of that show or not necessarily? You know, I heard it was a wonderful show. You never saw it at all? Never saw it. Mm -hmm. No interest, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, just because, again, you know, that's the office for me. Yep. And when I come home, I want to unplug from that. Interesting. Um, but, yeah, you know, it's interesting how you think about explaining this stuff to kids. And I, I don't really have a fully developed plan yet for my daughter, but the day will come.